Welcome to Navarra Live. I'm Michael Walker. And on this spring Friday evening, I'm joined from a dark room like myself by Aaron Bastani. Aaron, how are you doing? My room isn't that dark, Michael. I was just actually thinking about how shiny my forehead is. So, uh, you know, if somehow we could bottle that and then use it as a source of light in the cold winter <laughs> nights, then we'd really be onto something. But sadly, we can't. Uh, that could, uh, we could talk about um, electric vehicles later on in the show. If there were anyone who could do it, it would be the Chinese Communist Party. Maybe that's something they'll come up with in the next couple of decades. Um, that is one of our stories, the Chinese market, not whether or not they'll be able to capture um, the uh, the light reflecting off Aaron's forehead. Not that I think this is a problem for you, Aaron. I think you look fantastic. Um, we'll also discuss the US, um, who say Iran could strike Israel in the next 24 to 48 hours, should we believe them. Um, and Greater Manchester Police are now investigating Angela Rayner. And just sort of a couple of seconds before we went live, um, I saw she has confirmed that if she is found to have broken electoral law, she will resign. So that would be significant. Um, if you have no idea what we're talking about, you'll have to wait because we'll talk about it later in the show. He might be far ahead in the polls, but Keir Starmer is taking no chances. And he's been out talking to the right-wing press about his military credentials. The Daily Mail leads with Starmer, UK nuclear deterrent is safe in my hands. And Starmer has an article in that paper. Um, he's saying this... I want to be crystal clear to male readers. My commitment to NATO and the UK's nuclear deterrent maintained on behalf of NATO allies is unshakable, absolute, total. And he says that Labour will have a triple lock commitment to the nuclear deterrent. We have a triple lock on pensions. We're now going to have a triple lock on nuclear deterrent. Um, when it comes to the deterrent, um, the, the free locks will, will be these. Um, first, we will make a cast iron commitment to build all four new dreadnought nuclear subs here in the UK in Barrow and Furness. British investment supporting skilled British jobs and boosting British communities. Second, we will pledge to maintain Britain's continuous at sea nuclear deterrent, backing our brave submariners who sacrifice a normal life to keep us safe 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Third, we'll promise to deliver all future upgrades needed. We'll ensure our nuclear deterrent is properly equipped and armed to face the challenges of the decades to come. Now, I'm not sure if any of this is new in content, potentially somewhat new in tone, um, but I, I, don't, I think even Jeremy Corbyn under Labour was committed to all of those things, in fact. Um, there has, though, been another commitment made, this time in the I paper, that potentially seems more significant. So Starmer has told that paper that Labour will hike UK defence spending to 2.5% of GDP, which would be a £10 billion increase compared to now. So, is that the sound of an unfunded spending pledge? Remember, it was an aversion to those that killed the £28 billion climate investment pledge. Well, not quite, because Starmer qualified the pledge by saying he would do it, quote, as soon as resources allow that to happen. That does still imply defence will get priority over other areas, though. And that was a question put to the Shadow Armed Forces Minister on Sky. So Keir Starmer is saying that defence is Labour's number one priority. So is it more important then to a Labour government than schools and hospitals? Well, I think the answer in politics is always and rather than or. But we do know that... But if you make something your number one issue, it does imply that other things are less important. Well, there's certainly um, uh, a, a, an importance of making sure that our defence spending, our defence and national security picture is secure against rising tensions. We need to make sure that we've got the investment going into our armed forces. But for any voter out there, before they start looking at our health, our education, our environment policies, as important and critical as they are, they want to know that national security and economic security is safe with a Labour government. You can see consistent. We can see what their sort of electoral strategy is. They're worried that people who care about economic and national security um, will have second thoughts about Labour. They want to sort of hammer that home that they really care about both. Um, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has dismissed the plans. We're already pledging to get there as soon as we can. But the thing about this uh, announcement today by Keir Starmer is it's just not believable. He specifically said he'll back Trident, that's our nuclear deterrent. Well, 11 members of his shadow uh, team that he's appointed, including his shadow foreign secretary and the deputy prime minister, all voted against the nuclear deterrent. He'll just say whatever he thinks he needs to say, whatever you, he thinks you need to hear in order to get your vote. And it's just not credible. Grant Shapps there, focusing on 
Keir Starmer's tendency to change his mind. Um, not that necessarily he has changed his mind on on Trident, but he's saying people in his shadow cabinet have, and as we know, Keir Starmer has changed his mind on a lot of other things. Um, Aaron, um, what does it mean to say we will boost defence spending to 2.5% when possible? You know, you, you could equally say, you know, we'll fund a space program when possible, or we'll build, you know, everyone their own personal hospital if and when it's possible. I mean, do you, do you take this seriously in any way? I take it seriously in so much as it demonstrates there's a, there is a priority here for defence. Uh, I thought Luke Pollard's response to Sky News was utterly ridiculous. The answer in politics is not either or, it's and. No, it is either or. That's literally what politics is about. Politics is about the language of priorities, as was famously said. And the reality is when you're um, entering government under very constrained circumstances, priorities are everything. There will actually be very little money to go around. I would almost say, Michael, that if you were to increase the defence spend by 10 billion plus a year, it's just a shade over 10 billion, I think. If you were to increase it by 10 billion pounds a year, look, over 10 years, that's that's really gonna that's gonna pay for something like HS2. It's a huge amount of money. That's the increase. We're not talking about the defense budget, we're talking about the increase. So that's a huge sum of money to be talking about. 100 billion over 10 years could do transformative things, particularly for our cities in this country. It could actually transform half a dozen cities in the UK. And I think the priority for people on the left, actually, you know what, on the center right too should be about investments in the economic capacity and productivity of the country, infrastructure, education, skills, energy. Businesses need cheap energy. And, and I actually think there's a level of delusion going on if these guys are coming in and they think, actually, no, the priority, and they are saying that. That is overtly what they're saying at this point. Actually, no, the priority is an increase in defense spending, particularly in the context of where you see time after time Failures of military procurement in this country, complete white elephants. Look at our aircraft carriers, multiple billions of pounds each. Nobody thinks they're going to do the business in, in, the, in the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Sea or the Indian Ocean. Nobody thinks that. They leave Portsmouth for about a week and then they have to go back again. Now, they may get fixed at a certain point. That's fine. I hope they do. I hope they weren't a waste of billions of pounds. But the point is, when you have time after time this catastrophic misuse of public funds with regards to military procurement in this country. I don't think it's healthy, worthy, or smart to think, actually, you know what, let's just increase it another 10 billion pounds a year. I don't think that, even, even if you think that we need to be improving our, our defense spending, our defense outcomes, we're genuinely concerned about various threats around the world. If, if you think that, legitimate, fine, we can have that conversation. But what? We're going to have more pork barrel projects like the failures with the aircraft carriers or, you know, outsourcing the extra money to Capita. By the way, Capita does army recruitment in this country. They waste a ton of money. They're so inefficient. Uh, but of course, Labour can't attack outsourcing and privatization because they're in bed with the interests that profit so much from that stuff. So whatever way you look at it, whether or not you agree with the diagnosis, I think the default of saying, well, we'll just increase defense spending. And by the way, finally, put that into counterpoint with the NHS. Where Streeting says, it's not just about more money. We don't just need more money actually to solve these problems, believe it or not. That's the outdated thinking of yesteryear from the left. Well, that's the precise logic you're applying to defense spending. Yeah, it's true. No one, caught, no one sort of says the defense budget is just this, what does he call it? Like a leaky bucket or something that we shouldn't throw more money into. I mean, we, we do spend a lot, a loads, loads more on the NHS than we do on the military. But I mean, I, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, on the particular issue of the nukes, let's hear from Starmer himself. He was in Barrow today where they build nuclear submarines. The only way to have a safer world is to have an effective deterrent. The nuclear deterrent has been effective now for decades. Uh, it's the single most important part of our armory to protect our country. And that's why I'm so committed to it. Um, and it's important that we see this as a long-term project because not only do we need the deterrence today, but we need the upgrades and the continued deterrence as we go forward. I do want a safer world, but it is important to appreciate that deterrence and safety go together. They're two sides of the same coin. The nuclear deterrence is the ultimate threat. Um, and therefore, of course, the deterrence only works if there is a preparedness to use it. Everybody understands that, and I understand that. Now, one thing I don't know, let me know if, if you know in the comments, 
if this is a kind of question that gets asked to politicians in all of the nuclear states, so I don't know if it's, you know, like when someone is running for the French president, do they also get asked this question about whether they would push the button and incinerate millions of people? I'm not even sure if I've, have I heard it in any of the American presidential debates? Let me know in the comments. Maybe you know, Aaron. I mean, in any case, what do you, what do you think of that answer? I suppose it's boilerplate, isn't it? It's not much else he, he can say. Or do you think he should have said something different? I don't think it is boilerplate, actually. I think we need a, there's a really important conversation to have about Trident, which is long overdue. Trident um, warheads manufactured in the UK, that's an independent nuclear capability. The actual missiles themselves are serviced in the US. We can't service them. We can't service them. How on earth is it an independent nuclear capability when the missiles you depend on have to be serviced by a foreign state? Now, people will say, well, it's the US. They'll be our friend forever. So, what? well, first of all, it's not independent. You're, you're depending on a foreign country which the French don't do. No other nuclear power does that, which is quite interesting, right? Um, and, and, and Starmer's signaling like this basically because he's in the pocket of the United States. As we've said time after time on the show since October last year, Britain does not make British foreign policy. It's set in Washington. Britain does not get to determine whether or not we have Trident. That is set in Washington. If you had somebody, this would be the curveball, if you had a Corbyn-esque fig figure but who said, look, I'm not against nuclear deterrence, but we just want to manufacture a domestic capability here in the UK, like the French. Um, it probably won't be maritime, won't be operational in the same way. You might want to call it inferior, but it'll cost a lot less money and will create a lot more jobs here at home. That would trigger an extraordinary response from much of the media because that's not, that's not the favored outcome of the United States. Um, I, I, I find it remarkable that this project, which is going to cost hundreds of billions of pounds, with regards to Trident renewal going forward. If you ask a question, it means you're unpatriotic, hundreds of billions of pounds. By the way, that's why the state, time after time, fails and fails and fails. We saw it with HS2. On the one hand, people say, why does everything cost so much? Why are we so bad at getting value for high, high expense projects? On the other hand, if you say, maybe there's a better way of doing it at Trident than Trident, if you say that, people think like you're cockamamie, you're crazy, you, you're not a legitimate person in the public debate. Well. If something costs 200 billion and you literally can't use it, if another country says you can't use it because the missiles are serviced over there, I, I think that's a problem. I think if, it's, if it was explained to most people, they would probably think that's suboptimal. Uh, but of course, it's not explained to most people. No, I think that's a decent point. Uh, yeah, he, he could have said that. I stand corrected. Um, the new focus on defence, I suppose, at the expense of, of the environment is not unique to the UK. Politico reports that the European Union is prioritising bullets over bees and has ditched its green focus ahead of EU elections. Now, the story is based on a leaked draft document containing the EU's priorities for the rest of the decade. And Politico reports this. A quick scan of a leaked EU priority list for the rest of the decade reveals a telling quirk. The only mention of environment is a promise to create a business-friendly environment. Instead, the document, essentially a mood board EU leaders compile every five years to guide the incoming EU executive in Brussels, is littered with references to defence, security and migration. Climate change is barely mentioned. Nature and biodiversity don't feature at all. And the article goes on to say that it's a marked difference from 2019, the last time EU leaders set out their vision. That strategic agenda put climate change front and centre – calling it an existential threat. One of the EU's top four priorities was building a climate-neutral, green, fair, and social Europe. Um, so it's very interesting. So about five years ago, I mean, as it's saying, exactly five years ago, I suppose, um, the EU was talking all the time about its Green New Deal. Sort of the idea was that, that the EU would, would, would mark out its sort of space in the world as a leader in climate technology and a leader in sort of um, mitigating climate change. And they were really putting that front and center. Five years later, it's all about defense. It's all about migration. Obviously, resisting migration is not about sort of how do we help people fleeing a war. It's about how do we stop people um, coming into Europe and how do we build up our defenses, I suppose, principally against Russia, because since then the war in Ukraine has started. So that might seem like a bit of a depressing change in priorities. I mean, it is a bit of a depressing change in priorities. On a Friday evening, though, I don't just want to make you depressed. Um, so there is some potential good news on the climate uh, issue in the Financial Times. Polita Clark said, we are close to the moment that global emissions start falling. Um, so Clark writes that this would be the first time in over 200 years that emissions have fallen, except, of course, during short-term financial crises or pandemics. So you get a little blip 
in emissions when those happens, but it doesn't really tell us that we've turned a corner. Um, she suggests this could have a big psychological effect on how we think about climate action, which is an interesting point. Um, she says this, some analysts think the politics, psychology, and even the financing of climate action could shift profoundly. I have to say this thought did not occur to me in November when research emerged showing that if today's green energy growth trends continue, and if gases such as methane are cut, there is a 70% chance that global emissions will start falling in 2024, making 2023 the year they peaked. She says, then I started running into people like economist Nat Keown, a former Obama White House advisor who is now president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions think tank. He is remarkably bullish about the impact of a global emissions decline. So he says, I think that would be an extraordinarily powerful political and psychological moment. And he added that it could broaden the base of support for climate action in several ways. Um, he says, first, it would be empowering because it would show that the fight against global warming was winnable, not a futile pointless quest. Second, a decline would offer concrete evidence that demand for fossil fuels was more fragile than appreciated and competition in the global clean energy race more robust. And Keown thinks this could shift the behavior of governments, boardrooms and investors because it would make fossil fuel investments look more like a dead end and green investments a competitive necessity. Um, Aaron, I want your thoughts on this. I mean, it's also worth saying, you know, the fact that they are falling, the climate scientists sort of say, we to keep within 1.5 degrees, they need to halve by 2030. So this isn't saying we're on track for 1.5 degrees. But it is saying that, I mean, and I've been saying this for a while on the show, that essentially the story when it comes to the climate is we are moving in the right direction now, but just not fast enough. Um, but the fact that we are moving in the right direction, maybe that will sort of motivate people a bit more. The other option is that it feeds complacency. So Britain has, I think, halved its emissions since 1990. And our politicians always stand up and say, look, we've already halved it. Give us a break. Um, Aaron, do, do you think there will be any significance um, to the moment at which global carbon emissions peak? Who's the we, Michael? This, is, this has been achieved primarily because of China. This, the, the idea that it's going to peak this year is, is because of China. China is looking at peak CO2 emissions, I think, in the next year or two, possibly next year. Originally, the target by Xi Jinping was 2030. Um, to be peaking at CO2 emissions at this level of their developmental trajectory is extraordinary. It's unprecedented. Uh, obviously, a world leader in electric vehicles, photovoltaic cells, they're rewilding considerably as well. People talk about their coal power stations, very real, very true. But they're doing so much other stuff as well. Um, world leader in, in wind, in solar, in new nuclear capacity that's being laid down, um, besides the, the other stuff I just said, EVs and rewilding. That is why we're looking at peak emissions actually quicker than we thought. So this idea that you know, we are not responsible. The UK, by the way, our emissions are massively down. Some, some is, is because of, yes, good positive changes. I think about 99% of solar um, capacity in this country has basically been put down since 2010 because it's got a lot cheaper. We had lots of smart subsidies at the start of that decade. They've kind of been wound down. Um, but most of the reason why Britain's seen its emissions fall our capita is, of course, we've deindustrialized. We've outsourced a great deal of manufacturing production to, to the global south. Um, Canada or Australia has done sweet FA. You know, their carbon emissions per head are about twice what they are here in the UK. So the idea that they've contributed this accomplishment that we would see by <clears throat> um, next year it is ludicrous. There are many countries that are not pulling that weight. Britain's doing moderately well, although there are some reasons for that which weren't intentional necessarily. Uh, but China is the overwhelming reason why it would be looking to peak. Other countries too, you know, I think about 100% of Ethiopia's electricity, almost 100% comes from hydroelectric, comes from dams. Vietnam in the last two years has laid down an extraordinary amount of um, solar. Russia is building nuclear power stations across Africa with Rosatom, this Russian nuclear power giant. Th these are the kinds of stories we're not really in receipt of here in the West, you know, we think that, oh, well, it'll plateau because of the smart people in the Financial Times and the smart people in the City of London, the smart people in New York. No, not at all. That's not, that's not the explanation here. Um, and in terms of it as a moment, of course, it could be a powerful moment. But I also think it'll be a powerful moment because we're recognizing, I think, in 2024, that the baton of technological leadership is, is moving east. Uh, and that's the case with a bunch of technologies. And it's it's overwhelmingly true with regards to technologies which will characterize post-carbon life, from getting around and traveling to energy-efficient buildings to rewilding, 
to you know next next generation materials for absolutely everything. I think they'll also be, by the way, world leaders in hydrogen storage, maybe even carbon sequestration. So that to me is the big story. Yes, it's plateauing, but the reason why is because of innovation technology that is not coming from the West. So the crowing that you would see by, like I say, the US, the EU, the Financial Times, I find partly absurd. It's a different world we're stepping into. This is great news. Uh, but let's be honest about why it's happening so quickly. That's definitely why it's happening before we expected it to, right? I mean, it is. we, we have halved our emissions, so it's maybe difficult to say that it's got nothing to do with that. But as you say, we sort of did that the easy way, which is we moved from coal to gas, whereas it's China that's sort of developing the, the new technologies that will actually allow the rest of the world to develop in a green way. Also, Michael, we in this, in this country, we chose to move to a services economy, right? And it's hit us for six, but it's, it's been, it was manageable until, to, to, until 2008. Germany is now deindustrializing because of something similar, although, of course, energy became too expensive post-Ukraine. There was an amazing article in the Financial Times yesterday. 43% of German manufacturing firms are looking to leave the country because mm -hmm. gas in the US is one-sixth of the price it is in Germany. One-sixth. And then on top of that, you have things like IRA and the CHIPS Act. IRA is the relevant one, really. CHIPS is microprocessors. Germans don't make those. IRA, in terms of building, manufacturing renewable technologies or technologies adjacent to renewables, massive state um, investment intervention by the US federal government there. Nothing comparable in Europe. So again, actually, Biden's done some really cool stuff on this, right? He, I mean, I don't think he's really responsible for what's going on next year. But in 10 years' time, we would be looking maybe at, at the Biden administration and saying, wow, the US is really competitive in, in these technologies because of what happened after 2020, certainly not because of Trump. Um, but the thing you're talking about there, Michael, you know, we, we've massively reduced our emissions, we're only 1% of global CO2 emissions. If, if Germany massively reduces its CO2 emissions, it's going to get a lot poorer, a lot, lot poorer in a way that Britain didn't because we had a very successful services economy, particularly in the southeast and the city of London. So is that a model? Is, is post manufacturing a model for? France, Germany, in the same way it was for us, Japan, I don't think it is. So, you know, yeah, the UK did some good things, but the model of moving beyond CO2 by literally getting rid of your manufacturing, not smart. Mm. Well, let's talk about moving beyond CO2 by modifying your manufacturing instead of getting rid of it. For Lenin, the socialist program consisted of peace, land and bread. And as women campaigned for the vote in the United States and sought to improve their conditions, they said they didn't want just bread but roses too. Now, China has its own slogan, updated for the 21st century, give me photovoltaic cells, but give me the Xiaomi SU7 too. Um, you might have heard of Xiaomi as a mobile phone manufacturer, but as of last week, they are also now in the car business, specifically electric vehicles, and their SU7 sold out for 2024 in just 36 hours. It starts at £23,000 and has a range of 700 kilometres and looks like a Porsche. No, really, don't believe me. Here's a video of Xiaomi's newest release. Now, I don't know much about cars. I can't drive. If you're looking for a review of the Xiaomi SQ7, I am not the man to ask. Um, but it looks fancy, and it is a symbol of Chinese firms entering the market for luxury electric vehicles, which has, up until now, been dominated by Tesla. Um, China's car manufacturers are very much on the march. In this video, you can see Xiaomi showing off their brand new car factory. Um, and it's one of hundreds of EV factories popping up across the country, not all Xiaomi, of course. And this has got Elon Musk worried. He's on record as saying that without trade barriers, Chinese manufacturers will pretty much demolish most other car companies in the world. So that's from Elon Musk. Um, however, it's not the upstart Xiaomi that currently poses the biggest concern to Tesla, but rather BYD, which has just overtaken Tesla to become the largest EV manufacturer in the world. This is a report from CNBC from two weeks ago. BYD has grown into this powerhouse. You look at the monthly rankings, they're always at the top. 
In 2023, BYD produced more than 3 million new energy vehicles, which include plug-in hybrids and battery electrics, surpassing Tesla's production of 1.84 million cars. BYD is so much ahead of Tesla in China, it's like a, it's just, it's almost ridiculous. Early on, Elon Musk was dismissive of BYD. Chinese car makers weren't taken seriously by their rivals. It used to be that foreign brands had the majority of the market share in China. Now it's Chinese brands. And when you look at the vehicles that these Chinese OEMs and Chinese brands are putting on the market, they are some very good vehicles. So he's saying it's now Chinese firms that are dominating the Chinese EV market. And that's a very big deal because it's Chinese consumers who buy more electric vehicles than anyone else. Um, and the comparison with the United States is especially stark. So in 2023, there were already 21 million EVs on China's roads, which compares to 5 million in the United States. And that gap um, only appears to be growing. In 2023, 25% of new cars sold in China came with a charging plug. Um, the corresponding number for the United States was just 7.6%, right? So the Americans really, really slow off the mark with this. The Chinese are just dramatically, radically, and very quickly um, shifting to have a pretty much a complete electric fleet. Um, so how did they do it? How did the Chinese do it? Well, according to Bloomberg columnist Lian Denning, it's the result of over two decades of planning. So he writes this, as the 2000s dawned roughly a century into the automobile age, Beijing correctly deduced that building a world-class export industry based around the internal combustion engine displacing incumbents from the US, Germany, Japan, and elsewhere was an unlikely prospect. In 2001, Beijing launched an R&D program to develop batteries, motors, and other EV-related technologies. This industrial policy, aided by supportive Domestic banks was matched about a decade later with the rollout of generous subsidies encouraging Chinese drivers to buy EVs. Importantly, imported EVs didn't qualify for subsidies and were subject to tariffs, and manufacturing subsidies were also conditional on local content requirement. Um, Aaron, so 20 years of planning. Um, lots of people sort of had dismissed the Chinese electric car industry. Now they have the biggest electric vehicle maker in the world, so BYD. Um, I know you're excited about this new Xiaomi SQ7. Um, tell me about it. What's the significance here? The Xiaomi SU7, Michael. If only we could get hold of that car for £23,000. Can you imagine? Every, every European automotive manufacturer would go bust. Nobody in Europe is going to buy. Look, for £23,000, I can get like a three-year-old Nissan Qashqai with a dent in it on Autotrader. Or I can have something which looks like a, a Porsche and has a range of 700 kilometers, like outperforming a Tesla on looks and performance. Porsche Taycan, like a, a secondhand Porsche Taycan, it's going to be like 65 grand, 70 grand, not, not electric. Come on. Uh, really extraordinary chart here. I've got it. This is what I'm looking down. 16 of the 20 largest EV car manufacturers in the world are Chinese. 16, I, I know it's not a very mature market, but 16 out of 20. Number three in the world, Michael, is a company called Wu Ling. I've never heard of it. It's the third largest producer of electric vehicles in the world. It's above VW. It's above BMW. It's above all the, uh, all the US firms, bar Tesla, of course. And then number four, Ion. Number six, Zika. Zika, I have no idea. I thought that was a virus. Michael, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. And it, this is actually something that I think, again, it's lost on a European or an Anglophone audience in particular, which is something that uh, a friend of the, the show, a friend of the organization said recently, Jay, on Twitter, great person. And they said, you know, I was in, I was in um, Southeast Asia, just holding for a while. I saw this brand I'd never heard of before, and I'd Google it, and I realized that's like the number one brand in the world for that particular thing. But of course, it's Chinese made, not EU or US made. And that's why it wasn't on my radar previously. That is the case in uh, electric vehicles more than anywhere else. Uh, and I think realistically, you're going to see in Europe, you're going to have to see, you're going to have to see massive, massive tariffs on this. But I, I have a question for you, Michael. Because, look, we talk about left-wing politics or radical politics or weird things happening in the world, which most people have a passing interest in, but, you know, whatever, take it or leave it. I have a feeling, Michael, you know, for, the, for a plasterer where I live in Portsmouth, right, for Dino, Dino is buying his car, and then he sees a, something that looks like a Porsche Taycan, £23,000, is made in China, and all the sort of the media that he has access to say China's going to go bust, it's useless, it's rubbish, they don't produce good products. At a certain point, there's going to be like this ideological realization where they go like, these people are full of shit. Like, this is really impressive. I want it for that price. Why are there mm. tariffs on it? 
I thought we were a free market. Uh, it's, it's really, really bad news. Again, in particular for the Germans. You know, the comparative advantage of German automotive manufacturing, even compared to the Japanese 20 years ago, was the engineering around the internal combustion engine. That was their, that was their thing. But if all of a sudden you get rid of the combustion engine, which of course you do with EVs, you don't have one, um, you know, it's like, it's like being a book publisher and all of a sudden you don't make books anymore, you make ebooks, all your printing presses, everything, it's all redundant. All the engineering expertise that they've built up over 100 years plus, 150 years in these companies, although of course they weren't making cars for all that time, all that engineering expertise you built up becomes irrelevant with this sort of, you know, this technological shift. Uh, really, really remarkable. And like so many things we talk about on the show, Europeans are not at the races. You know, mm. you can see a US EV domestic manufacturing industry. You can see it in China. You cannot see it in Europe. We are going to become a political and technological and an energy dependency of the US. We will not have autonomy in any of these areas. And our, our politicians don't seem to care. Like they genuinely, or, or they don't, they don't mind. I don't know. Which one is it, Michael? Maybe they don't mind. In a way, I kind of don't. like that. So, so when it comes to, to these Chinese cars, right, you can't get them in the United States. Um, they, I, I think the tariffs are 27%. So it doesn't make any sense for these, these cars to be exported to the United States. And if you are American, you can't, you can't buy any Chinese electric car. If you are in Europe, you can. Um, there's a great video online, um, Aaron, you'd love this, of, this, of a BYD um, container ship arriving in a German port because BYD, this electric vehicle company, has its own container ships that just say BYD on the side. And all they do is, is ship BYD cars around the world. Apparently, they've kept it in-house to try and keep costs down. The kind of thing that I don't think there is a container ship just for VW cars. So this is sort of impressive in, in its own right. Um, I do want to focus on America, though, for a moment because American EV cars are currently double the price of Chinese electric vehicles, but you can't buy a Chinese electric vehicle in the United States. So, you know, you were saying people in, in Europe might sort of realize, you know, China is actually at the cutting edge of everything. Why, or why do we still think of it as, as something other than that? Um, in America, the pressure might be, we want to, we're seeing these cars on TikTok. We want to buy them because they're half the price of, of the American versions. Now that could happen. Um, there is one other issue with the Americans though, because it's, it's not just that they're not as good at making electric cars as the Chinese is that their tasting cars is just just makes it harder to make a cheap EV because they have terrible tasting cars. They're like big, chunky, dangerous cars that fill up the road. And the best example of this, um, you'll not see a better example of this. The problem with am I allowed to say the problem with American culture? Maybe that's a bit essentialist. But in any case, this is how Elon Musk launched the Tesla Cybertruck. Things like rollover, because the center of gravity uh, is so low, it doesn't roll over. And if you're ever in an argument with another car, you will win. Yeah, so. In, in movies, you sometimes see the hero or heroine uh, hiding behind the car door uh, while being shot with bullets. That doesn't actually work un unless you're driving a Cybertruck. So grim. It's not the vision of sort of like a green industrial revolution I want. And the, the line that really struck out there if you were ever in an argument with another car, you will win. Or if you're in an argument with a cyclist or like a mother and a child crossing the road, I suppose that's illegal actually to do in America, isn't it? I saw someone get arrested for jaywalking. It was on, a, on Twitter the other day. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's just a vision of transport that electric or not, I just can't get behind. And my understanding is that in China, this, you, know, you don't have things like the Cybertruck. So one of the reasons it was quite easy to move straight into the electric vehicle market is because people didn't have this idea that they need this huge chunky thing that they're going to be able to drive you know, all the way across the country. Whereas in America, everyone's like, we need the biggest truck around and we need to be able to drive it from, from California to Ohio or something silly like that without, without um, well, I suppose if it's a petrol car, without 
filling up. Um, do you think American culture can sort of manage a a kind of green transition, or do you think it, because because they love big individualistic things which are like bulletproof for no real reason? You know, it's very antisocial. I think to drive around basically a tank because you can say, "Oh well, I'm completely invincible in this tank." Well, what about the people? next to you, right? It's very, very dangerous to be driving around in something that looks like a tank for everyone else. For you, you're great. You're right, Jack. But but everyone else is screwed. So do you think they're going to need a, a more fundamental shift in their culture than just some new you know, EV plants? That's a great question. I mean, look at the, 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 the success of the Hummer as a commercial vehicle, vehicle in the United States after the early 21st century. It was literally developed as a military vehicle, right? An all-terrain vehicle, a bit like you know the Land the Land Rover Defender was the British Army, although much bigger, much more robust. You know, could take a real pounding. Uh, I do think there's something. I think there's something deeply sick with the American culture. I'm happy to say that, and I think it's a tragedy that we have the misfortune of sharing a language with such a culture, because it means that where no, I'm being serious, Michael, right? Because those 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 vehicles are developed for like a ranch in Texas. You might not like that. I agree with you. It's antisocial and so on, but it's overwhelmingly um, the, the original buyers, and that's become a status symbol. But originally, you know, the pickups were for people who may were petty bourgeois, small business owners in relatively rural places or lived in suburbs. That, that was their vibe. Now we have in this country people buying SUVs, nowhere near as big, by the way. People pick on SUVs, but like you look at the hybrid SUVs in this country, when you actually go to North America and see the size of these things, your jaw drops. They're, they're like twice, they're literally twice as big. Um, but, you know, um, in Oxford, for instance, they're looking at um, p- putting a tax on SUVs. They should. I actually think that's a good way to do it. If you, if you need an SUV, you need an SUV, because you have two dogs and like four kids, and you have to have the prams and all that crap, I get it, you can't put that in a hatchback. That's fine. You just have to pay, pay a bit more. Um, so somewhere like Oxford, or again, where I live, Portsmouth, historic cities, which weren't even built for cars, let alone these things, these monsters, um, it's a, it, like I said, it's a misfortune of ours that we think this is like the end point of civilization. We need to be just like them. And on these tiny streets in somewhere like Oxford with terraced housing, you have these monster trucks, one after the other. Patently absurd. I mean, I hope that we imitate the Chinese approach and not the American one. And I also think this is a really important point you raised with regards to Elon Musk. You know, post carbon technologies in and of themselves aren't good, right? I don't want everybody driving a car, which is a monster truck, but just happens to be powered by electricity instead of oil. Um, I think there is a future for vehicles, private vehicles. I quite like private vehicles. That's fine. But we definitely need fewer of them than what we presently have. We certainly don't need more. We need more micro mobility. So using bikes um, in particular, electric bikes are great. I think they've got such a great future as a technology. Walking, buses, rail, and trams, of course. Uh, but if we are going to have EVs, and I think we will have some inevitably, I want them to look like the Xiaomi, not the Cybertruck. I suppose there's a, so there's something in between, which is the nice modest family car, right? Because the Xiaomi probably isn't that good for new kids. It looks like a, it's a, it's a tiny little sports vehicle, isn't it? Um, but I agree with you in general. I suppose full circle, because we also, we, we've been talking about family policy recently on, on this show. Maybe if you do a tax on the SUVs, then if you've got a really large family, you make sure that they've got some tax breaks for having kids that make up for it. According to U.S. intelligence, Iran could launch an attack on Israeli soil in the next 24 to 48 hours. This comes after Iran promised revenge for an Israeli attack on their consulate in Syria. Speaking to the Wall Street Journal, a U.S. official has said that Israel is bracing for a retaliatory strike, though they suggest they don't believe Tehran has yet made a decision as to where or when this will take place. The United States has issued travel warnings to its citizens in Israel, advising them not to leave major cities. The latest guidance says that government employees in the region could be subject to further travel restrictions at short notice. So how worried should we be about this escalating to a wider regional war? Um, Well, CBS asked a former Mossad official and Iran security expert. Is this the most worried you've been? Yeah. I think this is the most worried. I think it's uh, on both sides, in Israel and in Iran. She says if Iran strikes Israel, it could involve missiles and drones similar to the Iranian attack on a Saudi oil facility in 2019. They will try to do it on a military or a military uh, asset. The question will be the damage, 
how many injured people you killed, and I think uh, it has the potential for a huge escalation. However, she stresses that she still believes neither side wants a regional conflict, and that will be weighing heavily on Iran's mind. Shine told us that Iran's major dilemma is how to respond in such a way that the conflict does not escalate further. And likewise, Israel, she says, may choose to show restraint and avoid a direct conflict. <laughs> I trust a former Mossad to talk about Israel showing restraint. The only reason why Iran feel like they have to respond to this is because the Israelis bombed their embassy in Syria, right? It, that, that's part of their territory. I, I, I don't back that Mossad, uh, former Mossad agent sort of idea that neither side want escalation. I was talking to um, Trita Parsi earlier in the week, very, very smart guy. He said the Israelis want escalation. They want the US to come in and help them take out the Iranian regime. Aaron, Iran are in a very difficult situation here because they do need to, you know, restore deterrence. Israel keeps sort of doing stuff which seems somewhat provocative. They bomb their embassy. If, if they don't respond in some way, then Israel will just keep going further. However, if they do respond, then that might give Israel the pretext to sort of blow this into the wider war that it seems like they want. Um, what do you think is going to happen? What would you do if you were a leader of Iran? <laughs> Grand Ayatollah Bastani. Hey, look, it works on paper, right? I mean, I'm half Iranian. Uh, look, that, 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 neither side wants war. No, I don't think, you know, you can say Israel doesn't want war. They just want to kill and bomb people with impunity, but they don't want war. But they want war, but it's just one way. They want to wage war and not get anything in return. 13 people were killed in that consulate building in Damascus. 13 people, which you've only heard in the last couple of days. Also, initially, it was just the IRGC people, by the way. They had diplomatic credentials, Revolutionary Guard people, including the most senior general, um, military officer, rather, for Iran and the Levant. Um, there were other people as well, because, because it was a consulate building. 13 people died, but they don't matter. They, they don't matter. We are, we are back to where we've been repeatedly since October, which is that Muslim life is less valuable. That's clearly, just look at how this is being reported. Arab and Iranian life is less important. It must be because 13 people dying is just an afterthought. You know, there was a BBC report earlier today, Michael, you know, Israel is worried about an Iran Iranian attack. Didn't say, well, why would Iran attack Israel? Because this is fine. You can kill 13 people in a consulate. It's fine. No problem. They're Muslim. Okay, do it again. And, you know, the people that on their receiving end, well, they, they can't do anything. How dare they? Don't they believe in the rules-based international system? What's, what's the rule? Israel can do what it likes and nobody else can retaliate? Really? That, that, that's the rule, rules-based international system right now. Collective punishment against civilians, blowing up embassies, uh, by the way, killing civilian scientists in Iran for many, many years. That's been happening for a very long time. Um, killing aid workers, British aid workers. All of these conventions and, and, and laws being broken repeatedly. But apparently, we have a rules-based international system. It's like, it's Orwellian doublespeak. Like, it doesn't mean anything. And this final sort of pièce de resistance in that regard is, is the idea that Israel's worried about being attacked by Iran. Israel's attacking Iran. Like you say, a, an embassy or a consulate is is sovereign territory. It's a very serious thing what Israel did. And I don't think Britain should be supporting a country which behaves like that. They should not be no political support, no military aid, no anything. You do not want to do that. It serves Russia, for instance, for those kinds of norms to collapse. It does not help Britain, a small country which broadly speaking benefits from the international system that we have. We're on the Security Council, things like that. It does not help Britain to all of a sudden say, yeah, you know what? All these conventions and norms, screw them. It's not in our national interest. But again, nobody can say that. Nobody can say that. Why? Well, we, we covered that on the, on the show a while back. Alan Duncan said it. You have conservative friends of Israel, 70% of Tory MPs, Labour friends of Israel, 70 out of 200 Labour MPs. They will not criticize a country which is costing Britain significantly now with regards to political, geopolitical, and potentially military uh, consequences. If there is a regional war, we're going to be involved. You know, for somebody watching this right now who, who's anti-migration, what do you think happens if there's a war between Israel and Iran and Iran was nuked? What do you think is going to happen? Millions of people are going to leave that country and come to Europe. What do you think is going to happen? It's crazy. And it's not on the radar of something like Farage. 
or, a, or, or somebody on the right who talks about migration nonstop. What do you think will happen if you turn Iran into Syria, a country with a population of 90 million people? We have Syrians in this country for a similarish reason, right? Conflict. The mind truly boggles. Um, and time after time, I've asked the question, I never get an answer. The way Israel behaves is not remotely in America's interest. It's not in our interest as Europeans. And yet our politicians side with them and give them carte blanche. When are they going to stop? What's the line going to be? And I, I can guarantee you, Michael, that's also a question that's asked among political circles in, in Tehran. They must be thinking, what on earth are the Europeans and the Americans doing backing this madness? I think you're right on Orwellian doublespeak. And let's end this segment with another example. Now, this is really, really ridiculous. The US is now seeking diplomatic interventions um, from other countries um, in this standoff. They've asked China and others, including Turkey and Saudi Arabia, to urge Iran to stand down. And the US State Department spokesperson, Matthew Miller, said that, quote, escalation is not in Iran's interests, it's not in the region's interest, and it's not in the world's interest. Now, what's gone on here, right? For six months, the United States has been going to the UN General Assembly, or sorry, the, the UN Security Council, and every time a motion has been put forward, to say, we need to call for a ceasefire here before this escalates. They say, do we have any vetoes? The United States, yeah, we're vetoing. Yeah, we're vetoing. Um, they're, uh, they're giving all of the arms that are fueling this conflict. And they're backing this country that just bombed someone's consulate, which is something you are not supposed to do in international politics. Now, Iran, as we've said, you know, they're not angels, but they're in a very difficult position here, right? They are the ones being provoked um, in, in this particular standoff. And then the Americans are saying, okay, we're going to give, you know, unparalleled, unconditional support to one belligerent to do whatever the hell they want. Can you guys just restrain your, your guys who haven't really done anything <laughs> yet, right? Iranians haven't done anything when it comes to this conflict. They say China has to, has, to, has to sort of hold back the Iranians while the US gets to say to its ally, you do whatever the hell you want. We're going to give you absolute cover on the Security Council and we're going to give you all of the arms you want and all of the arms you need. Like, you, you can't block motions calling for de-escalation for six months. And then when a country sort of feels like it needs to retaliate to restore some kind of deterrence, say, oh, by the way, China, uh, now, oh, we're really in favor of peace now. Can you keep your, your Iranian friends under control? Just ridiculous. No one is going to take this seriously. And that is why we are in a dangerous moment, because it does seem like Israel wants to provoke a wider war. Um, the Iranians are in a very difficult position. Do they restore, you know, they, they have to restore deterrence. They don't want to spark a, a, a broader war because, you know, that would be very, very damaging to their country. Um, and then the Chinese are probably just looking and thinking, what the, he what the hell do they want from us? Like thinking of the Americans there. Very worrying, stupid policy from both the United States and the United Kingdom. You know, it's, it's some sanity, please. Some sanity, please. You can't just say, we're going to whip up our guy and you hold back yours. Doesn't make any sense. Now, this next story is one I had been ignoring on purpose, right? Because it seemed somewhat small fry. But now the cops have got involved, and we probably have no choice. That's because Manchester police have opened an investigation into Angela Rayner. The investigation into Labour's deputy leader concerns the sale of her council house. So what's going on here? Well, it seems to be the culmination of a story that's been pushed for weeks by the right-wing press. Back in February, the Mail on Sunday branded Angela Rayner a hypocrite for having made a £48,000 profit on the sale of her council home. Now, the hypocrisy suggestion then was because Labour have said they will review right-to-buy discounts if they get into office. Now, that story seems rather banal, a sort of classic hypocrisy thing, you know, that the press like to do. But in early March, the paper upped the ante with a new story about the home. So this time, the paper declared there were new questions for two homes Rayner over council upgrade for house she didn't live in. Now, the claim there was that Angela Rayner had benefited from an upgrade to her council home, even though, which she didn't own at that point, even though according to the mail, by then, she had moved in with her new husband a mile away. So she, she got the council home before she got married. Um, then she gets married and they're claiming she moved in with her husband, um, but the council weren't fully aware of that and then uh, upgraded the house. That's their claim. Um, then this became a story about tax. So we've gone from 
you know, we've gone from hypocrisy to the council did it up when she wasn't living there. And now there's an element which is a claim that she avoided some tax. And now that's because when Angela Rayner sold her council home, she didn't pay capital gains tax. Now that would be perfectly above board if it was her main residence. You don't pay capital gains, capital gains tax, sorry, on a main residence, but it would be problematic if she in fact principally lived somewhere else. Um, these aren't huge numbers we're talking about. According to the BBC, if it were the case that this wasn't her primary residence, she might owe the tax man £3,500. Not insignificant sum, but we're not talking sort of major political corruption here. Um, it hardly seems earth-shaking to me, but the Mail, once again, have a different perspective. So this Monday, um, they led with the headline, Rainer's making a fool of you, Keir. Um, that was based on a statement from the Tory um, chairman or Tory deputy chairman um, saying the situation was corrosive to standards in public life. Of course, the Tory party are not an organisation that can speak with any integrity about those. Um, so is any of this really a problem? Well, this was Angela Rayner speaking to the BBC late last month. I've been very clear. There's no rules broken. The police, they tried to manufacture a police investigation. They said there's no issues there. I got tax advice, which says there was no capital gains tax. It's a non-story manufactured to try and smear me. But at the same time, you've got the chancellor in the budget making snide jokes at the dispatch box while many working people are struggling with their bills. And he forgot he had seven luxury flats. Conveniently, I've never been in those circumstances before. And yet the way in which that was portrayed over the last couple of weeks, I felt was unacceptable. I got expert tax advice that was very clear that there was no capital gains tax and there was no wrongdoing, there was no unlawfulness or anything else in regards to my property 15 years ago. I was a home care worker, you know, I didn't have an accountant. I had, as most people would, you put your house on the market, you get a legal conveyancing solicitor and you get an estate agent. But since those allegations were put to me, I got expert tax advice to make sure that I hadn't done anything wrong. So Raina was there speaking before an investigation was open. So at that time, the police weren't looking into it. And what seems to have changed is a complaint from Tory Deputy Chairman James Daly. Now, according to the BBC, Mr Daly is understood to have made police aware of neighbours contradicting Rayner's statement that the property um, was her main residence. So she's saying she did still live there. Um, her neighbours saying, no, she didn't live there. And presumably she left, she lived, she lived with her husband, sort of a kilometre away or something. Um, Keir Starmer is standing by his deputy, though. He said this today. We welcome this investigation because it will allow a line to be drawn in relation to this matter. Um, I am fully confident that Angela Rayner has not broken the rules. She will cooperate with the investigation, as you would expect, uh, and it's really a matter for the police. And why are you so, so confident? Angela Rayner also plays a very full part in campaigning. Um, would it make sense, while the investigation is going on for her from a neutral point of view, not to be as visible a, a, a presence for the Labour Party? The important thing is that Angela Rayner has already given uh, no end of answers in relation to this matter. She will, of course, cooperate uh, with the police. And I think that uh, it's now a police investigation and uh, we need to let the police get on with their job. He's saying he stands by Angela Rayner. As you might imagine, Grant Shapps um, saw uh, an opportunity to attack the Labour Party. I think the double standards have been extraordinary. Angela Rayner herself has spent her political career calling people out for exactly the thing that she seems to be doing now. It's not acceptable to ignore it, and it's not acceptable for Keir Starmer to say he won't even re read reports uh, into it. Uh, this is something which is a serious matter. It's important that it's looked into properly, and I welcome the idea uh, that the police are doing that. Now, I still think this story is very small fry. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a huge issue to me. And I, of course, do not take Grant Shapp's outrage as genuine. I think he's the guy who sort of has, has done various things under different names. But he does perhaps have a point about double standards. During the Partygate scandal, Angela Rayner tweeted this, Boris Johnson's Downing Street is under police investigation. How on earth can he stay on as prime minister? Um, so on that situation, she did think that, you know, being under police investigation was enough to mean you should not be prime minister. Presumably, he should resign. Um, so that does potentially open her up to claims of double standards. Um, an update um, just before we went live. 
I mean, I suppose potentially related to this sort of claim about potential double standards. Apparently, Angela Rayner says she will resign if convicted of breaching electoral law. Um, so I should add the other, so the, the police, it seems to me somewhat ambiguous whether they're investigating the tax issue or um, something relating to electoral law, which is that I presume when Angela Rayner stood to be an MP in 2015, she put down that house, so the the the, the ex-council house, the council house at that point, as her address when the claim is that she lived with her husband, which would be a breach of electoral law. Very, you know, marginally important law. Um, but she said that if she is found guilty or convicted of it, um, she will resign. Uh, Aaron, all seems like a bit of a mess, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't think she should resign. This is ridiculous. Mm. Utterly ridiculous. And I think they've managed it completely wrong. I think they've managed it in an awful, stupid way. They should have just said at the outset, I mean, if I was advising her, and I don't know it's going to happen anytime soon, um, I would have said, look, I'm very happy to cooperate with HMRC if they if if they think that actually a payment should have been made, I'm very happy to give them the cash. By the way, this will have happened to many MPs um, uh, with regards to capital gains and whatnot. It can happen. Like you said, it's only £3,000. It can happen. HMRC pursues these kinds of things literally all of the time, like every day of the week. So I, that would have been a wise approach for me. So if there was an oversight 15 years ago, I'm very happy to pay it back. Let's, let's have a process and find out. It was an honest mistake on my part. I have no idea. I've got advice. They said nothing wrong has happened, but it's in the, the balls in the court of HMRC. And most people would be like, yeah, that's a normal response. The idea that you would stake your political career on this is crazy to me. Many politicians have done far, far worse than they've, they've thought, wait. I find it absurd, actually. She's basically, she's put herself, she's got like, the sort of Damocles over her head, but it's Tom Harwood and like the Daily Express. Why, why would you do that? This isn't like a factional point. If this was a Tory MP, I'd say the same thing. It's, it's obviously tax. Labour are very big on tax avoidance, tax evasion. I get it. But it's such a, you know, it's like somebody who's an electrician and they, you know, uh, they don't add a job or they forget to add a job in terms of their um, their tax at the end of the year, their self-assessment at the end of the year. It can happen. Obviously, if it's £100,000, it's £3,000. It can happen. It's an honest mistake. And I think people should be able to make honest mistakes without having to, like, leave public life. I think she's a good MP. I think the country is better off having somebody like Angelina in politics. There's not many people like her, former care worker. Um, we need people like that in politics. So I think it's an absurd decision that she's made. In terms of the electoral law thing, again, it's not a major thing. It happens relatively frequently. Um, and again, I think it's just an honest oversight. So the fact that she would allow other people that level of control over her future, I find odd. And I think, you know, maybe there was a defensive thing at the start saying, I've done nothing wrong. I, I just think it's very healthy to say, well, if I have, happy to rectify it. Sorry. Honest mistake, if that's the case. And as she said, there's advice saying that she's done nothing wrong. Great. There was, was also a contradiction though, Michael, because she's saying on the one hand, I have expert advice, but then she's saying, well, when I sold the property, I didn't have expert advice. You know, she's saying that there was a, a um, uh, you know, you had your, your surveyor, conveyancing lawyer. I mean, they're not going to tell you to pay. That's irrelevant. It's immaterial. They're not going to tell you to pay capital gains tax. An accountant might do or should do, but it doesn't sound like she had advice from somebody like that. I think the claim she was making from that clip is she's saying, she's saying, look, look I'm a normal working class person. I don't have a tax. And that's why she, they could easily go on the offensive here as well, because this is small amounts of money compared to the sort of money we're talking about when it comes to the Conservative Party, and especially Rishi Sunak, who's almost a billionaire, right? Mm. This is a house that she sold for, I think, 150 grand um, and she made 40 grand and the capital gains tax would have been three grand if she'd paid it. So this is small amounts of numbers, well, small figures. And you can say that this is the kind of issue that ordinary people get into in this country that they wouldn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I think the claim she's making is that at the time of sale, she didn't have a tax advisor. And she's sort of saying ordinary people don't have tax advisors. I had a surveyor, I had an estate agent, I had what ordinary people have, but I didn't have a tax advisor. But she's saying after the event, she checked with a tax advisor and the tax advisor said, oh, yes, everything was above board. So it's advice she sort of sought after the event. Yeah, but I still, I still don't think that's good, Michael, because if it is potentially a second property, obviously you should consult an accountant. Like, uh, that I, don't, I, see, I don't see how that's helping her. You're, well, you're, she I just think you're opening, your, you're opening she yourself up to so many lines of attack. I mean, the thing is, she wasn't a politician at the time, right? So I suppose most people just think, well, a tax advisor, that's just going to eat into the 
capital gains I can make from this. So if you're if you're talking small amounts of money, well, if, well no, but then that no, no, Michael, because then that is intentional tax evasion. That's different. I, if she, if she said, look, it was my first time. Maybe it was technically my second time because there's some picture saying I'm at home, which is just pointless, right? Stupid. But she's, you know, that you're making a different argument, which is she she would have known. I mean, if she knew what she was doing and then she's done, that's different. No, no, I'm not saying she would have known. I'm saying, why would she? Have, I'm, I'm saying it seems reasonable for me that she didn't get a tax. Adv- I don't think, I'm not saying she, she didn't get a tax advisor because the tax advisor would advise her something she didn't want to know. I'm saying she wouldn't have got a tax advisor because you have to pay a tax advisor. And if people are doing, like, I don't have an accountant, for example, but I do my tax return for the, well, the, you, the work I you, do outside of Navarra. The reason I don't have an accountant is because I'm like, that's going to eat up too much of the small amount of money I, I make in my self employed role anyway. Well, if you ha- if you sold an, a- an asset for 150 grand, even if you were, you know owned half of it or whatever, and you were only getting half of that, I'm I'm pretty sure you would actually, Michael. But anyway, mm. um, to be honest, like, I would quite like, like an accountant. Point, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, you, no, especially because you're. Uh, it was different for her, right? Because she was a salaried worker, As somebody who's yeah. self-employed. I mean, I, I I think you almost certainly would have an accountant go through that because obviously you'll pay at the end of the year and your assets will be significantly higher. Mm. But Look, regardless, I, I, I think that the mistake here is management of the thing from the start. And I also, my ears pricked up um, at the start of the week, Michael, when I heard an interview with Keir Starman. He said, I've not seen the, um, the details in regards to her potential defense. I've not seen it. My team have. Yeah. And I think he's giving himself a get out of jail card here. And that to me is worrying because Starmer, by the way, he'll turn on her as quickly as he turned on Jeremy Corbyn. They'll all turn on each other. Look at where streeting on the cast review. I mean, they'll all turn on whoever they turn on their grandmother if it helped them. Um, no, but they would. And I, I, that that's probably the most worrying thing for me was seeing Starmer's response at the at the beginning of the week. And I thought, uh oh, why is he saying that? Mm. Yeah, he's saying I don't need to see the advice. My team have seen the advice, but I don't. He's yeah. saying I don't want to see the advice, which is probably smart politics. But yeah, they have been defending her, you know, up until now. Although I, he hasn't said if she should resign if she gets convicted but now she said she would anyway so i suppose i wonder if she said that actually because of pressure from starmer that's also possible um let's wrap up there um you know i don't think the biggest development this weekend will be this investigation into angela rayner but we'll see um aaron it's been a pleasure as always being joined by you on a friday evening really fun really fun michael wonderful weather hopefully it holds the weekend hope you enjoy yourself and hope everybody watching and listening enjoys themselves too i only echo that sentiment from Aaron Bastani. You've been watching um, Navarro Media. Come back on Monday at 6 p.m. for another stream. Good night.